This is Big Ideas from the ABC. A man who, in my estimation, is uh, well ahead of Mary McKillop for canonisation in Australian circles, although perhaps not uh, th via Rome. <laughs> um, we're here to discuss uh, this wonderful tome, Hitch 22. Uh, Christopher, may I call you Chris? No. Thank um, you, right? <laughs> no, you may not. I, I promised my mother no circumcision of the name. <laughs> No amputation. That's of the first name. Right, OK, all right. Well, we'll, we'll I've amputated the second one. Fair enough, too. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with Christopher then. Um, you've taken on many large and imposing subjects. Uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, a woman called Therese or something, I forget, I forget her name, uh, and um, God. Um, but you've taken on something a tad more substantial now, yourself. I thought I'd ask you yeah, to this, be... This time it's personal. <laughs> the first memoir that's actually a sequel. Um, I thought I'd, I'd begin by asking, how did you find the experience of writing a memoir as opposed to your, your usual kind of excoriating grace on other subjects? Sweet of you to put it like that. <laughs> uh, well, tough, because normally I'm making a case, hmm. laying one down, trying to be an advocate, trying to explain, trying to marshal evidence, and so on. Um, in your own case, you aren't doing that. Or I'm not, anyway. It's not an apologia. Uh, second, um, I'd normally be trying to see how much I could cram into a given number of words and how economically or tersely I could do it. And with um, memory, you keep finding, and mine's alarmingly good, uh, you keep finding you, you recollect more and you want to get it down while you can, so it balloons out a bit and bags. I, I gave the publishers much more than they asked for. Mm, mm. And then, obviously, I suppose, but it wasn't obvious to me before, you don't know how it ends. Um, so, it was, so it was very useful to me that the National Portrait Gallery in London published a catalogue of pictures of a, a group of people who I used to be associated, well, still am associated with, in which I was referred to as the late. Because <laughs> nothing concentrates the mind more than reading about yourself in the past bloody tent. <laughs> and it was, that, it was at that point I thought, well, now I have an answer to the argument, isn't it a bit early? Mm. <laughs> well, you can't do it too late, can you? Well, certainly you, you, you don't have the option of a prequel having begun uh, where you did, but uh, uh, perhaps a sequel on its way. How did you define the task of writing your memoirs? Did you, did you rule things in and out at the outset? Or, yeah. yeah and, and what did you rule out and why? Out first. Um, anything about uh, people who'd um, indulged me <clears throat> in any way at all, unless they were dead, um, or public figures and were asking for it. <laughs> uh, because you can't do that fairly unless you're willing, unless the book is only about those I loved, which it isn't. Uh, so I have no copyright in anyone but myself. That was one. Second, on the whole, only to try and write about myself when I was with people or in places that are otherwise intrinsically interesting. Hmm. So that, uh, that, avoid being boring and try and locate myself in places and times or with people who, who might attract interest in it on their own, for their own sake. And what did you find um, the easiest part of the memoir to write and what the most difficult? Um, in, can I do that in reverse order? You may. The most difficult was about my beloved mama. Mm. So I decided to write that first, about her, her being taken away from me early and by her own hand in a suicide pact with a lover, an unsuitable lover. And I thought if I, 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 I'd been wondering all my life if I could, this was a long time ago, 1973, whether I could ever or would ever want to write about that. But I thought, well, I can't not, so I now I'll find out. And I, I wrote that in one go and then read it through. Um, and then I wept, to my own surprise, quite a lot. Um, but then I thought, but I don't I hope no one else weeps about it. I don't want it to be a tearjerker. I don't want it to be sentimental. 
and I sent it to the publisher and said, if you like this, then I think we can do it. And if you don't like it, I don't want to do it anymore. Indeed, yeah. And they, they were quite nice. They said, if, if you carry on like that, it, it, it should be okay. <laughs> and it is, I mean, it's an amazing scene, uh, the way you describe uh, first laying eyes on the Parthenon uh, from a, uh, a unique location. Yes, well, my, my mother's deathbed was, uh, was a crime scene. That was a horrifying moment because, as I was told about it on the, on the radio and read about it in the newspaper before I got to Athens, she'd been murdered by her lover, and that's what I arrived there thinking. A man you'd met? A man I'd met, and she wanted me to approve of, and I sort of did. I didn't disapprove. He was a, a gamey guy. He, my father, I should add, was a very honest and very decent and very upright and, and um, thrifty and reliable man. But he bored my mother. And the, the boyfriend wasn't honest or upright or thrifty or righteous, but he was amusing. He was a spoiled priest of the Church of England. He had once been vicar of St. Martin's in the fields. He was slightly poetic. Um, he was a bit tubercular. Um, he had the, you know, the ingredients of romance, uh, and um, uh, but bipolar, probably, and, and depressive. Uh, on the, uh, probably a bad catch, anyway. And I, but she desperately wanted me to like him. <clears throat> so I, I sort of gave her my approval. She needed my approval. Um, and, but I didn't disbelieve that he might have killed her, actually. I thought it was possible. Anyway, once I got to this terrible hotel, room in the middle of Athens um, and realized with this uh, 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 incredibly grisly sight that it hadn't been a murder, it had been a suicide agreement. And what uh, made you realize that? Well, a letter she left, uh, some photographs the police showed me that I had to look at, all kinds of stuff. Um, what am I saying, all kinds of stuff? I mean, some very, some very harrowing and wrenching and lacerating material. And also the, the terrible stench of death, because they hadn't been discovered for a little while. Um, I went to the window. I just couldn't stand it anymore. Threw the window open, and suddenly there, on the on the hill of the Acropolis, was the Parthenon, as if I was seeing it for the very first time. Well, I was seeing it for the very first time, but as if I'd clocked it for the very first time. Um, and. In my book, I say, well, the first memory I have of my mother is Mediterranean light. I was crossing the harbor of, the Grand Harbor at Valletta. Some of you may have been there, one of the great Baroque and Renaissance cities of Europe, where Caravaggio did some of his naughtiest painting. And my first memory of her is this flash of blue, green, and white of a lovely uh, Baroque and Renaissance city coming down to the harbor, meeting the green and blue of the sea and the sky. A flash, that's my first memory. A lovely way to have a first memory, and I'm holding her hand. And then this other amazing flash of Greek attic light, but seen from a, from a death chamber. So those are the bookends of my memories of, of Yvonne, as I call her, because it was her name. But there's a certain distance in, in, in that terminology, isn't there? Did you, how did you describe her when you spoke to her? Did you call her mum or mummy? Or? No, I would call her Yvonne because she liked it. If, if you're a Navy wife, as she was, my father was a naval officer, but most of my ancestors, male ancestors, are naval and military. The, the Navy wife would be called Ethel or Marjorie or Joan. I don't know if you're getting a picture. <laughs> Sterling women all, and you know, representing the British Empire overseas in various bases and so on. Yvonne, kind of stylish name by comparison. And she had a bit of class and character, very beautiful, was very well dressed, never embarrassed me at school speech days by wearing the wrong hat or anything <laughs> like that. She's lovely, and so, and, and it was a Frenchified name. And um, I knew she liked it if I called her Yvonne, so I always did. You refer to your father um, in the book as the commander. Is that how you spoke to him as well? Or? Well, he, that's what the family called him. Really? Uh, yeah, the rather, rather depressed, rather pessimistic, um, rather taciturn chap. Yeah, and he'd, he'd risen to the, through the ranks to become a commander, and then they let him 
Hitler, and then they let him go after the war. He hadn't got, he hadn't got the next level of promotion. He never forgave the Navy after having been in a very arduous war against the Nazis, running guns to Stalin across the Arctic Circle. No, not what he'd signed up with His Majesty's forces to do, was to run guns to the communists, but it was his duty, so he did it. Very brave, had a horrible time. They let him go at the end of the war, and then they put up the pensions for people who joined later. He never forgave them for it. But it was the big thing in his life that he'd been in the Navy. So we, we would call him partly respectfully and partly affectionately the commander. Um, and I remember one day I thought, I'm not a great one for breakfast or early mornings. My father was an early morning guy. He'd go down and make breakfast in the kitchen for himself. My mum liked to lie in as well. I thought, maybe I should just go down and have breakfast with him. I should have put this in the book. And I'm his firstborn, you know, we don't hang out much. And uh, maybe he'd like it if I just came and said, you know, I came down. Morning. He looked up and he said, bloody hell, it'll be family prayers next. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought, okay, I'm not going to do that. I, I, you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> so did, did writing about um, your, your father and mother change the way you, you think of them or feel about them? No. I mean, I, it, it didn't because I've, they've been gone for a long time and I've had a lot of time to inwardly digest all that. But there is another question that came up in my life long after my mother was gone, and as my father was dying, my mother's mother, mm. if you follow me closely here, uh, who lived to be nearly 100, as did my grandfather, realized there was no further purpose in keeping a family secret, which was that my mother had a Jewish parentage mm. and had not wanted me to know and had not wanted anyone else to know either. So just as I'm going through that experience that um, Yates says is the crucial one of losing your father. Granny arrives and says to my brother and to myself, I've got something to tell you. And it was a rather vertiginous moment. And I, so I, I have had to interrogate things again in retrospect. Why did she never tell me? Was she ever going to? What was her motive for keeping it quiet? I think I can now guess. And how and, did you do that? Well, I think that she, well, for one thing, she could pass. She didn't, as they say, look Jewish, which now I, now I realize that my grandmother rather did. Um, she and her mother had had a slightly hard time in the millinery business um, in the 30s um, and the 40s. England is not a country that's uh, disfigured by any bad record of anti-Semitism, but there's low-level stuff. You know, people would say things like, oh, they've got lots of time to spend on Sundays, or um, if a... If a Mr. Rubinstein was made, oh, very fine old Anglo-Saxon name. You, as, as the man in the Chariots of Fire says, Harold Abrams, you catch it on the edge of a remark. That, nothing horrible, but a little, a little, a little bit of uh, edge there. And I, I think she was absolutely determined that her children wouldn't suffer from this. Mm. And that, that Christopher Hitchens, Christopher Eric Hitchens, the firstborn, would become an English gentleman. So you be the judge of how well that worked out. <laughs> and, um, well, I must say, as an American, you do a very good impersonation of an English gentleman. <laughs> well, you do say the sweetest things. <laughs> um, Yvonne would have been, actually, she would have been very happy to hear that. Um, she would have felt she'd, it had been all worthwhile, because she had to sacrifice a lot to get, get me to school well. and things like that. And she would still be asking, as would the commander, um, this is all very well, but when are you going to get a proper job? <laughs> uh, and, and you describe uh, in, in the book uh, the journey that you went on having um, discovered this information. Yeah. And I was curious, um, did you go on that journey as a journalist or as a relative? Well, I went to, if you mean to Poland. Yes. Yeah. My, my mother's ancestors came from what is now Poland, but was when they lived there, Germany. As, as you all know, there's been a lot of trouble every time that border has moved. Um, it's a very worrying area of Europe, and a lot of terrible things have happened there and are, and are 
still buried there. Um, and they'd left in, in good time, actually. I think they saw it coming. So half of my life has been spent writing about matters arising from the movements of that border, mm. how much it costs to change the name of the city of Breslau to Rochwov. In any case, it's, I mean, anyone who's taken any interest in the life and times and authorship of the 20th century is already invested in that, whether they're mm. Jewish or, mm. or Polish or German or not. So it wasn't just a root stroke, no. no. But it yeah. was that as well. Right, yeah. Um, and um, did the personal nature of the engagement change the way you experienced it? Well, if you go to Breslau, um, you'll find that, well, Edith Stein is from there, for example, the, the Jewish woman who converted to, became a nun and was sent to Auschwitz. Max Born is from there, the man to whom Einstein wrote the letter saying God doesn't play dice with the universe. The man who invented Zyklon B, poison gas, is from there. Um, it's an extraordinary place. It was the the setting for the midnight of the century, the Hitler-Stalin pact. Um, and it was the last city in Germany to surrender after Berlin. They held out so long there was hardly one brick piled on another. And then after the mass murder of the, after the Judeo side, the, the Shoah Holocaust, there was then a uh, mass expulsion of Germans from there as well, which conditioned the building of the Berlin Wall. So I almost felt trivial. I, this is a whole chapter in my book, but I almost felt trivial intruding my own family history into it, but I wanted to know why Mr. Blumenthal, my ancestor, had left that small town, Kempno, when he did. And I wanted to find out what the context was and, and to see what had happened to the, those he'd left behind. So you talk about this, making this discovery and, of course, becoming a, an American as well. How do you identify yourself now? Anglo-American. I mean, I, I didn't move to the United States until I was about 30, so it would be silly to say I'd left everything behind. I mean, mm. if I just went around saying I was an American, people would think it was incongruous. There's not much of a twang in not the accent. Not a lot, no. no, no I, I speak American now. I mean, for example, I say I'm going to the store rather than to the shop. And if I'm at the shop, I say, do you have, not have you got? And I avoid the word schedule, schedule altogether. Because <laughs> I can never remember now which one it is. And stuff like that. But, but um, and I don't like hyphenation. I think Americans should identify as Americans. But the fact is there are people who say they're Polish-American, <clears throat> Greek-American, Arab-American, so on. Oddly enough, the Jews do it the other way around. It's the American Jewish Committee. Mm or the American Jewish Congress, not the Jewish American one. I don't, I've never quite been able to work out what that is. But Anglo-American is, is a literature. I mean, Henry James was an Anglo-American. W.H. Auden was an Anglo-American. T.S. Eliot was an Anglo-American. It's a, it's a subject. It's not a, a bad it's, club. It's a culture. It's not bad. I make my students in the, at NYU, sorry, New School, New York, um, say, answer this question. W.H. Auden left England and became, if not a, exactly an American, certainly a, a New Yorker. And T.S. Eliot left St. Louis and became a high Anglican, an Anglo-Catholic, um, and uh, someone who was almost more, tried to be more English than the English. Which culture got the best of this exchange? <laughs> it's Auden, by the way. Um, <laughs> So I think one, one can decently do that without any, any reservations. And when I had to take my oath, which I did on Thomas Jefferson's birthday, which is also mine, at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., and they said, well, do you forswear allegiance to any foreign princes? And I had a sudden picture of Prince Charles. <laughs> <laughs> He'd gone sometime earlier. A sort of, <laughs> uh, sort of bat-eared, Islam-fancying, <laughs> no taste in girls. Um, <laughs> Not uh, much pause there. Re resentful, balding, <laughs> jug-eared, uh, who, will, who will, when his mother dies, become, at that instant, head of the Church of England, head of the state, and head of the armed forces. That's what you get if you found a church on the family values of Henry VIII. <laughs> I could see myself saying, no, I forswear allegiance to it. <laughs> that, that prince, I can... I can, without that prince, I can do. 
Good night, sweet friends. <laughs> Uh, you write uh, at one point that uh, there is, I think what you describe as a sweet law, that uh, the person who should be scrutinising your work uh, almost inevitably does. Yeah. Um, who's that for this book? Well, in this case, it was, I once wrote a piece not long after I made my, my discovery of the family secret about my Jewish self, and it, it was called On Not Knowing the Half of It. And it was published in an incredibly obscure magazine in New York, Literary Quarterly, edited by a guy called Ben Sonnenberg. Uh, probably in circulation of about 2,000 people. And then it did get reprinted. Actually, it won a prize. It was chosen for the best American essays of that year. So it was promoted to a slightly more widely circulated book, probably 10,000 readers. And then it got picked up here and there. And eventually, I knew it would happen, someone wrote to me and said, I'm your mother's cousin. Uh, it's bred on the waters. It, it, it's bound to happen. Mm. Um, and I know exactly where Nathan Blumenthal came from, and I can t give you directions to the old town in Poland. It took a long time. It's the same if you decide to use the word clitoris or something in an article. You think, my Aunt Grace in Tasmania will never see this piece. <laughs> she never, she's just and not... the one day... <laughs> I can safely say clitoris. She's never going to see it. And then... Uh, uh, Christmas. That's what Aunt Grace searched a, a to find the article. Oh, yeah, at Christmas, a letter arrives, and it's Aunt Grace from Tasmania, <laughs> and she encloses a teddy bear because she's forgotten how old you are, Aunt. So she, I do, I do try and follow your career, dear, and I understand that I, I, I'm so thrilled that you're a writer. But someone sent me the most extraordinary article the other day where you <laughs> used this word that I, have, I, I, I couldn't I believe you were doing. It. Ah, nice. <laughs> no, you, 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 you realise all your life is lived in public. Yeah, we. Uh, well, I asked you earlier about the, the hardest uh, bit of the memoir to write. Um, uh, we didn't quite get round to the, the easiest or the most fun. What was that? Oh, the easiest um, is the chapter about Martin Amis, mm. who is the only blonde I've ever really loved. <laughs> um, or loved passionately and for a long time. And who's been a huge influence on me and is, is, is my best and my dearest friend. And, um, and who I didn't think of putting it quite like this when I wrote the chapter, but what it really is is an answer to the question, or an attempted answer to the question, can you have a heterosexual relationship with a chap? And my answer to this is probably not, but I'm willing to give it the old college try. And, and indeed, you've so given many a, things the college it's try. A, it's, a love, it's a love letter try. Yeah, the old college <laughs> try has been a feature, yes. <laughs> um, Were you... Oh, well, no, I see, yeah. <laughs> well, go on, then. <laughs> well, no, you go on. <laughs> no, you're the boss. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, I, 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 I was interested in that. I mean, you, you, you talk uh, with uh, uh, unusual candour about your... Um, uh, homosexual sexual experiences, uh, but then you, you, you talk about your friendship with, with Martin in a, in a very different um, register. Um, are they entirely separate things? Yeah. I mean, the, the gay moments in my life were all when I was very young. And when, as it were, if you were looking for an excuse, it would be, well, there aren't any girls around here anyway. They've locked us up in a monastic school. And what are they fucking expect? <laughs> um, well, that's what they expect. Yeah, yeah that's what they expect. That's very, whether they expect it or not, that's what they got. And, but the, the emotions to my the emotions could be involved as well. Well, that's right. And you do uh, you do yeah. talk about those yeah, experiences being experiences yeah. of love as well. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, the other, the other reason I decided to include all this was you know, I live in a country where every now and then, and actually quite quite strongly at the present time, that there are attempts to have homosexuality defined as a, as a, as a disease or a disorder. And not only in the United States, but by the, by the Catholic Church and others. And I thought, well, I think as a minor gesture of solidarity, I might as well say what 90% of male heterosexuals know, which is that uh, gay experience is not unknown to them. And that, furthermore, that homosexuality is a form of love, not just a form of sex and demands respect and, if you want, protection uh, on those grounds alone. So to the extent I can con contribute to that recognition, I ought to probably do so. No, no, no. <laughs> Good.
God, you, you wouldn't have thought there were so many bum baggers in an Australian audience. <laughs> <laughs> I thought... I thought mateship in Oz was strictly platonic. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do Plato here. <laughs> um, uh, but to Martin, that's a very different... Uh... No, well, with Martin, that, I mean, the, the subject we had in common was very intense, very uh, uh, deep-going, very uh, ruthless uh, scrutiny of the the woman question, as viewed from every conceivable angle, and this never over, the subject absolutely never over, and always ready to resume it, and uh, fascination with it. Well, that's not something you write about uh, much. Well, no, because, again, I don't have copyright in those, in those uh, ladies. Mm. More's the pity. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the things that, that uh, really comes across uh, in your friendship with Martin, but also many other people, is uh, the tremendous fun you have. You seem to be quite good at fun, uh, and in particular, uh, wordplay. Um, uh, what's well, your favourite word game? I was very lucky with Martin and, and others in the late 70s. We, we had a, a sort of lunch club every Friday in somewhere between, roughly between Bloomsbury, Soho and Fleet Street, that world where we'd all meet with um, Clive James. And I should say, uh, I almost feel like pausing for a second in memory, um, the late Peter Porter, one of Australia's most beautiful and brilliant ex exports to, if he was an export, I think he always felt Australian, to England and one of the great contributors to English poetry and poetry criticism. And Terry Kilmartin, the translator of Proust, who was the book's editor of The Observer and a few others. and. Yeah, we would try and improvise word games. Um, the, uh, do you want the inexpensive one? Because it had to start low and then build. <laughs> I mean, start if you, medium, but let's get well, to the high bits. Um, if you change the word heart in any common poem title or song to the word dick. Total eclipse of the dick. Sounds cheap, but total eclipse of the dick. Yeah. I left my dick in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> don't go breaking my dick. <laughs> dick Break Hotel, uh, no. Dick, no. Down at the end of Lonely Street in Dick Break Hotel, yeah. Uh, that's when your dick aches begin. Um, the dick is a lonely hunter. So, so you, you, I, can, I can do this for quite a long time. Yes. But if you, you would, we, we did the hard thinking about heart dick. Then, then you see, you, you play this. It's quite puerile, you'll agree. It's pathetic to be laughing at this kind of thing. But then, then one day, Woody Allen is interviewed about running off with his adopted daughter and setting up house with her. And he says, well, the heart wants what it wants. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> so th then things would improve a little bit and say the greatest player, the greatest player of all these games, and the man who really raised the whole level, about whom I have a whole chapter in. But by the way, the book is called Pitch 22, and it's published by Alan and Unwin. <gasps> Available at fine, I fine it, books. Uh, I've got. I can sell it to you afterwards. <laughs> the whole chapter about Salman Rushdie, who is a genius at this kind of thing. And with Salman, one day it was, it was a dinner, and someone arrived late, having been delayed you know, on a flight. And he said, "I had a terrible time being delayed on this plane." And not only was it a bore being delayed, but there was nothing to read at the airport bookstore except Robert Ludlum stuff. And he said, and "I had to buy one. And I, I knew it would be bad. But I had no idea how bad it would be." <laughs> And that didn't seem very controversial or interesting. So he went on about it, though, and said, I mean, the part, it's the titles, these crap titles like, I don't know, the Iger Sanction, or you know how it goes. The, the, they're so bad, I can't even remember them. But you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then, by good chance, someone said, well, what would a Shakespeare play be like if, if Robert Ludlum had written it? And Salman looked up like that and said, OK. And I said, all right, well, what would Hamlet be? And he said, um, the Elsinore vacillation. <laughs> With no more time than I gave you. Mm -hmm. I said, well, all right, but you can't do that twice. What about Macbeth? He said, 
the Dunsinane reforestation. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, he could go on that we, as well. We went on through, we went on through um, the kerchief implication, <laughs> um, the Rialto sanction. He's a genius. And he then invented one all of his own, which was the titles of books that didn't quite make it. Um, nice try. Um, the Big Gatsby. Um, <laughs> Uh, good expectations. Uh, let me think. Um, for whom the bell rings. <laughs> Mr. Zhivago. Um, and I think I contributed at this point portrait of a woman, which I. <laughs> but then he said, "This I think is almost the best. It's two days in the life of Ivan Denisovich." <laughs> so he can. He can just do that. Okay. But what people want, I find, is filth, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so why, why don't you change the word love to fuck and see what happens there? <laughs> and you're, uh, you're not bad at rhyming your filth either. Uh, um, you, you, you've spoken, well, you've written about um, feeling some limitations as a writer compared to your august uh, yes. friends. Um, and I might get you to comment a bit more seriously, seriously on that later. No, I should do that now. OK, well, I'll do it now then. Well, they, it, was, it, was very, it was very useful to me working at the New Statesman, which was then a, a pretty good political literary magazine in London, with some prestige to it, with Martin and with James Fenton, who I, th I still think is the best poet writing in English, and um, Ian McEwan and others, Julian Barnes, all on the staff or on the contributing periphery. It was very handy for me because just by talking to them, listening to them, I learned a lot about writing by osmosis almost. But I also realized that people who can do fiction and poetry have an ingredient of stuff that I don't have. And so I thought, I'm not gonna, my little ambitions for the bottom drawer, that slim volume, I think I'm not gonna waste the public's time with that. I'll concentrate on the essay form. There I think I might contribute something. And I, I've since then evolved a theory of a sort that um, those who have poetic and fictional capacity, which I don't possess, have a musical ability, which is another thing I don't have. When, when confronted with musical notation, I feel dyslexic almost. I, it, I just don't have it. And I've been told by some critics and professors of literature, much senior to myself, that I may well be onto something with this. But if you, and then if you think about it, I mean, Shakespeare is, is practically a musician. It's full of music. So is Chaucer. Um, the romantic poets are a lot of the Russians. Now, Bokhov didn't like music, but he understood it. Dickens was a musician. I'm going to, I'm going to press this on. And, and uh, Ian McEwan can write, Ian McEwan could write a review of a concert, whether it was jazz or classical, easily. Several of Salman's novels are practically set to music. Martin can play. Um, I think it might be a, a useful way of introducing different and styles of ability. You certainly describe Bob Dylan as a poet. Bob Dylan's certainly a poet, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but you have dabbled at least in some forms of verse, mainly dirty. Um, uh, do you, you, you say you've got a good memory? Uh, any limericks that spring to mind? You see, people expect filth at this point. <laughs> The limerick, More is, filth is, the limerick is a very capacious and elastic and subtle form. Um, I would give you the example of um, the young engine driver named Hunt, <laughs> uh, who was given an engine to shunt, um, saw a runaway truck by yelling out, duck, saved the life of the fellow in front. <laughs> You see, I know what you wanted there. <laughs> Whereas Robert Conquest, who is another member of this luncheon, he's now 94, he's born in 1917. Um, a great historian, um, principally of the Russian Revolution, but of Stalinism. And the master with Philip Larkin and King Slamis of the Limerick. And he, everyone here knows the speech from, as you like it, The Seven Ages of Man, Jacques' address on all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely peers. And they have their exits and their entrances and each man in his time plays many parts, the, these being seven ages, right? You've got it in your head. 
see the opera house you're doing um you're doing monty python so we're really stepping up i can do the philosopher's song too if you want (laughs) but um so here's the seven ages of man as done by robert conquest seven ages first puking and mewling then very pissed off with your schooling (laughs) then fucks and then fights then judging chaps rights then sitting in slippers then drooling Shakespeare was so damn verbose. This, Jacques, Jacques' delivery is 28 lines, yeah. and this is five short ones. And Conquest also did the history of the Russian Revolution in Limerick. Um, I don't suppose you can recall it, can you? The, the once was a fellow named Lenin who did two or three million men in. Um, <laughs> that's a lot to have done in, but where he did one in, that old bastard Stalin did ten in. <laughs> and then Calvin's theory of predestination can be done in a limerick too. And you, do you recall it? There once was a man who said, damn, it is born in upon me I am, a creature that moves in predestinate grooves. I'm not even a bus, I'm a tram. <laughs> <laughs> but just not to disappoint, there was a young hooker from Q <laughs> who filled up her pussy with glue and said, with a grin, since they'll pay to get in, they can pay to get out of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's what they wanted. <laughs> such, a, such a dead giveaway. Wasted the Shakespeare on them, too. <laughs> now, look, I hope at this point you'll afford um, me the courtesy that I think um, Isaiah Berlin afforded you of a, a, providing a polite answer to a question that you get asked all the time um, about the things that you... you, you uh, didn't write about in, in the memoir. But I wanted to ask one thing that I, I haven't heard you ask about yet. Um, you don't write much about your brother. No. Why not? Because, um, I mean, you've had a very public history. Yes, and I thought that people can already read that if they want to. Mm. So I didn't want to go over old ground at all. And because since we were very small, we haven't lived in the same town or been in the same job or had very much contact. Have you discussed that with him? Is he, is he a bit miffed? Uh, no, he's not miffed at all. I mean, he wouldn't, I don't think he would particularly want to be in my book. I'm in his new book, which is a actually very interesting book just published called The Rage Against God, which is his defense of the Anglican religion against people like myself. And it, it, it has a, a long and actually rather beautiful nostalgic account of a lost Christian England in the 50s when we were small the cathedral close, the security and deference of Britain, something that he wishes could come back. And I don't miss particularly in that way at all. I, I feature in that a bit. Um, we, we've talked about your, some of your great friendships. Um, obviously, in the, the changes of your political positions over the years, um, you've probably lost a few friends as well. Um, are there any uh, that, uh, that hurt to have lost? Um, well, I should say first, I also made some very nice friends. Sure. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz? For example. Many handsome and beautiful and brave Iraqis and Kurds who I wouldn't have met if I hadn't been on their side in getting rid of the private ownership of their country by a psychopathic crime family. Um, I prefer the new ones to the ones I lost in that respect. Thank you, by the way. It's, uh, <laughs> quite rare and very restrained. Uh, <laughs> uh, There's something of an expectation that there might be other people joining us. No, I don't <laughs> think so. But, no, but it's nice to know there are some people who get that point. And, I mean, look, Martin wrote a, a book about, about communism, which I thought was very bad and said was bad, and which misrepresented my opinions I think unintentionally, but to me annoyingly. But I would never make a political disagreement a cause of a quarrel with a friend. I mean, I, I think it's silly to do that. But there's a tendency on the left, and I bet there are people here who know what I'm talking about, to think that if someone in any way dis- disagrees with the left, it must be for the lowest possible reason. And that if you found the lowest possible motive, you found the right one. There's this whole culture of no one would, would leave us or quarrel with us if they weren't a sellout. It's actually a very sick mentality and very widespread. And people who think like that or feel like that um, can dump me if they want. But that's almost as much as to say that they weren't much of a friend. 
Anyway, I'll pull myself together and go out and find someone nice to <laughs> So who, uh, who do you rate or highest? Or someone more principled, perhaps, or more courageous. Okay, well, who do you rate highest? More courageous. Okay, well, who do you rate highest of your new friends? That would be telling. <laughs> I was asking. Not telling you, sweetie. <laughs> um, I'd have to, I would... You wouldn't know their names, but I mean, they, would, they are people in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere who are on, I won't say on my side, who are on our side, on the side of civilization against barbarism and theocracy. They're worth knowing. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful thing in my life to find them and count them as friends. It's a matter of elementary, internationalist, socialist solidarity to me. To be on their side and on the side of their uh, long oppressed women folk. Actually, I will give you a couple of examples. It seems to me that the three most beautiful words in the secular language now are um, Ayan Hershey Ali, who's become a great friend of mine, and who's some. Um, that's better, and who has been through rape, genital mutilation, forced marriage to a relative or close to a relative, uh, beaten, uh, brutally treated, exiled, and so on. And who, and who genuinely considers herself to be a lucky person because she's probably the only survivor of her class in Somalia who's still alive and who witnesses for the most important thing of all in this combat, which is the, the rights of women. And the, and the empowerment of women is the only cure we know uh, to poverty and deprivation. And um, just being able to find myself a friend of hers and speak up for her and say a few words in her behalf is, is, I tell you, is worth a lot of disapproving gazes from Michael Moore, say. <laughs> Who is, of course, also very beautiful in his own way. <laughs> you, um, obviously, you know, your, your, your stances on um, uh, Islamo-fascism, which I think you claim to, you, you've coined? If you well, not quite. I mean, I, when I wrote my re reaction piece to 9-11, I said it's fascism with an Islamic face, which is a borrowing that some of the older comrades here will remember from, from what Alexander Dubček said about socialism with a human face in Czechoslovakia and what Susan Sontag said at a very famous meeting in solidarity with Poland in uh, 1982, uh, that the military dictatorship in Poland was fascism with a human face. Um, so, but you can't say fascism with an Islamic face every single time. So, uh, and anyway, not everyone's going to get the reference every single time. So it got a bit compressed into Islamo-fascism, which isn't, doesn't quite have the same resonance. But there we are. We need a word for it. But, you, I said, but you've written, as I say, um, very publicly, and everyone knows the, the kind of the, the changes uh, or the perceived changes in your position on, on these things and supporting the, the war in Iraq. Um, You've also written at great length and, and fantastically about um, the Founding Fathers, uh, and in particular Jefferson. Um, does it trouble you that even if you obviously felt you're on the right side of the argument in relation to Iraq, that some of the ways in which um, that conflict has been prosecuted, and in particular um, uh, long-term detention without trial, that in fact you can be on the right side of an argument but still potentially fundamentally undermine the values which Ooh, define sure. a nation? Yeah, you can. I mean, I remember, I remember going to Abu Ghraib um, not long after the liberation of Baghdad. And where it, it's... Um, I divide people, by the way, as between those who knew about Abu Ghraib before 2003 and those who walk around as if it was a prison opened by the United States um, for its own purposes after 2003. If you didn't know about Abu Ghraib before 2003, be very modest in what you say about it. But it was a place where at one point it was an industrial execution shed and torture chamber where hundreds of people were hanged every day, often from the same beam at the same time. And where when, when it became overcrowded and the numbers needed to be culled, the guards would go out with the list of names around, around Baghdad and go to the families and say, we can keep your son off the list for execution if you give us a thousand dinars and so on. Impossible to deepen the night, the sort of the pornographic element of the Saddam Hussein regime and the smell of the place when it was broken open 
is with me still. And I remember saying to the people I was with, don't, don't use this anymore. Don't try and convert it into a prison. This place needs fire from heaven. It should just be blown up and salt should be sown in the ruins. Don't try and use it. It's evil. I actually think evil is a word you have to use. You can't do without it. And evil has a particular stench. And I can personally claim to have smelled it, winded it, scented it. Anyway, no one listens to me. <laughs> I often think that's, you know, a lot of what's wrong. And they <laughs> um, ignored me. And, they, so, and the place did become a nightmare. Not a, nothing like on the same scale. I won't even have that suggested. Prison conditions in Iraq have vastly improved since the arrival of the coalition forces. Anyone who doesn't know that is a fool. But recreational torture on video. And I wrote and I said and I believe that um, it didn't change my attitude towards torture. I mean, I've been waterboarded because it, I wanted to find out what it was like. I thought the main contribution I could make was to see, well, is this torture or not? Yes, it is. It didn't change my attitude towards torture. It very nearly changed my attitude towards capital punishment. I thought the people who did that in Abu Ghraib should have been taken out and shot. I would have protested against it eventually if they were put up against the wall, but I wouldn't have had my heart completely in it. Um, it would have been nice to have them shot out of hand. Well, a brief and fair trial, but then shot out of hand. <laughs> so, um, uh, how long did you last in the waterboarding? I've seen the footage, but no, You have. Well, not yeah. very long the first time, mm. because everything in you uh, reacts to the sensation of being drowned. By the way, you read in the newspapers, um, it's, it uh, mimics the sensation of being drowned. It's not at all that. Um, you are being drowned, except slowly. So your whole body goes into a spasm of resistance to this, and time has no meaning at all. But when I looked at the clock, I thought, Jesus, no son of Commander Hitchens should <laughs> have uh, wimped out as fast as that. So I asked them to do it again. I lasted a few more seconds, but the point was pretty easily made. Uh, by then. And for quite a long time afterwards, I had, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say post-traumatic stress disorder, because many honorable warriors who've been through much worse than that have had that, but I did have very bad nightmares, which I normally, I never had nightmares, and I kept all the time thinking that I was being choked and was drowning. It, it went, didn't go away for quite a long time. So that's, uh, that's waterboarding. How do you think you'd go um, with uh, whiskey boarding? Well, the um, guy goes into a bar, <laughs> says, I'd like a glass of James Walker, please. The barman says, um, you mean Johnny, don't you? Said, Not when you know him as well as I do. <laughs> <laughs> I people are constantly surprised by this, but I can actually take a drink mm. and um, manage it, handle it, carry on apparently ambulant. Mm. Uh, I think it's actually one of the stronger arguments against uh, atheism. Uh, I believe your liver is a miracle. People come from far and wide. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, I have some advice for boozers in my book. I mean, mm. the thing is, don't mix. Very important. Try not to drink on an empty stomach. Uh, drink plenty of water. Dance with the one that brung you. <laughs> um, all that kind of thing. And don't do it, don't use it to cure the blues, for example. That would do you be speak from experience there? No, except indirect. My father was someone who was a pessimist and would, I mean, in a morose way, drink, and it would only make him more morose. Whereas I'm, um, even in War says about Charles Ryder, or Charles Ryder says of himself, rather, in Bright City Visited, that he drank for love of the moment and to prolong and to enhance it. And that's what I do. I, if the dinner party's going well, I want, I want it to go on longer and louder and for my own part in it to be more <clears throat> prominent and um, <laughs> so forth. But if, if you drank to, if you drank because you had the blues, you'd be in big trouble. And then never say um, that I don't remember last night, because you do. <laughs> Some hostesses will accept this excuse. But, they shouldn't. And, or rather, if you really don't remember, then you're in terrible trouble. And, and, and has that happened to you often? No, I have no amnesia at all. It's a quote from the same novel when Anthony Blanche says, um, I left school under a cloud. And he pauses and says, why do they call it that? 
It seemed to me like a shaft of the most unwelcome light. <laughs> <laughs> no, if, if, if I was embarrassing to anyone or you know, for any reason, which I don't necessarily confess that I was or am uh, the night before, it would, the, problem would be you'd the problem would be you'd remember it only too well. So I don't think it should be a socially acceptable excuse. Well, look, um, uh, as with all um, Hitchens conversations, we could go for uh, hours, even just to exhaust the, um, uh, the heart puns and the limericks. Uh, but uh, I thought we might open it up now to uh, you guys who've come along this evening. There are several microphones uh, through the hall. Um, interestingly, I think there are, there are four, but they're numbered two through five which I assume means that's number one. Um, but if you would like to ask uh, Christopher a question, please do come up to the microphones. There's, uh, we've got two here, three here. I don't know where four is. Where's four? Just there. Um, and uh, you're most welcome to uh, uh, pose a question. Keep it relatively brief, or else I'll Tony Jones you and take it as a comment. Uh, <laughs> So um, we'll start over at number two here, you sir. Um, with greatest respect, Hitch, um, given that you're being very reflective about your own life and your experiences, um, I was wondering if you had a few comments about Eric Prince, if you know the man that I'm talking about when I say that. The artist formerly known. No. <laughs> no, that would be the, um, the CEO of Z, now Black, oh, Blackwater, now Z. Um, with his own Christian din dominionist take on the, the war on terror. Um, and I was, was wondering if you'd read Jer Jeremy Scahill's book when considering your position on... I have to say it's gone past my bat, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, well that was a good start, excellent. Um, <laughs> we might go to uh, microphone number five, thank you. Being in a hopeless position when being waterboarded, would you think twice about uh, God being great or not? I didn't get I, that. I didn't, could, could, sorry, could you ask that again? I did, I, could you give I, it some welly? Yeah, I heard being in a hopeless position of being waterboarded, could you... Would you think twice about God being great or not? Didn't get it. Sorry. There's, is, as, Dudley, as Dudley Moore used to say, can't hear a blind word, you say? Yeah. So would you think twice about... <clears throat> God being great or not? What was the preface? To that? <laughs> Having been waterboarded. Um... Yeah. I collect non sequiturs as well, by the way. <laughs> of which that's a real peach, I've got to tell you. <laughs> it's going in the. Uh, in the... Um... Next. <laughs> Well, we're going to get through a lot of questions tonight, ladies and gentlemen. That's one of the yeah. upsides, let's say that. Uh, bring, let's try. Bring, bring it on. For <laughs> let's try microphone number four. Yeah, a question I wanted to ask the panel of which you were part earlier today, um, but I didn't get time. Um, uh, you, by way of illustration, you've said once before that it is a cultural achievement that we no longer use a certain six-letter word starting with N, and in the context of needing to be on our guard um, against self-censorship um, with vague language um, for the sake of things like political correctness, how do we identify them? Right. I think I got at least the first half of it. It's a cult, um, basically, um, you're resuming an earlier session in the Writers' Festival, to begin with, uh, but you say it's yeah. a cultural achievement not to use a, uh, a six-letter word starting with M. N. N, right, OK, yeah. well, that does prove how difficult it is to hear up here. Oh, um, sorry. Could you repeat the second half of the question? This is oh, just, this is just gonna go fantastically. Um, Why don't you yeah, um, take it back? <laughs> yes. Tell them yeah. all to sit down. That's right. Look, we'll, we'll, we'll try a female voice. It was nicer with How about that? <laughs> Didn't you think it was nicer when it was just the two of them? I was having a ball. <laughs> <laughs> We'll try one, one down here. Regret going no. to a female voice. What? Um, no, Christopher, I'm a great admirer of your work. Thank you. Particularly your views on atheism. Yes. Um, 
which um, people of my generation particularly can ascribe to. But you wrote an article I'd like to take issue with in Vanity Fair, perhaps uh, maybe three years ago. It was a brief article where you, you claimed that women were not funny. Yeah. Um, I've had many discussions about this article with my friends. Uh, and, and I suppose I'd like you to talk to that because the way I can sort of re rebut that is, I know that you're a lover of literature, and, and I look at women like George Eliot and Jane Austen, and I think that how do we define a word like funny, and, and who owns the interpretation of that? Because, you know, in drawing rooms and, and in, 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 you know, in, in I think we've, we've got kitchens the and pubs. Okay, you've got the yeah. gist. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I, I'd like you to, to talk to that if you would. You get it? I, 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 got, I got some of that. Not, not. Uh, um, seems to be some shrill, humorless bitch. <laughs> um, uh, the thing is this, and she was, but she began very sweetly by saying that atheism was an important principle, which it is, and I'll just say this about that. It, one of the threads of my book is the struggle to find a position that's consistently anti-totalitarian. I think that's a responsibility everybody has, whatever their other politics are. And the original form of dictatorship, as George Orwell points out, is theocratic. The first declaration of independence you have to make uh, before you can really assail the, the totalitarian position is to say that there can be no um, celestially imposed, unalterable dictatorship. That, that, that's the most sinister uh, kind of war. Now, to the, to the lady's point, some people think that by saying, by asking the question why women aren't funny, which by the way is making the assumption that they're not, that I mean that there are no female comedians or wits, not so, um, but you will notice of um, Roseanne Barr and Sarah Silverman say, for example, both of whom wrote to me saying they thought I was right about this, that the female comedian is either a dyke, or a Jew, um, or in some other way a man, um, and they're funny to precisely that extent, and that there are biological and evolutionary reasons why this should be so. Uh, if you, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you, if you, if you today, tonight are talking to a friend who says, if it's a she, I've just found a great new chap. It's a moral certainty that she'll say, and he really makes me laugh. You've heard it, haven't you? When did you last hear a guy saying, I've found a really precious new squeeze, and then he'll say a couple of other things that I'm not going to share with you. And he's not going to say, and she keeps me in stitches. Or if he does... Does that say something about and women no, or the priorities no, no, of men? No, it's both, because women, because women don't need to be funny. They can be if they want, but they have no need to be in order to make themselves attractive. They are, to men, if you follow me, already attractive. Um, whereas for most men, what, what are their chances of getting laid if they're not funny? <laughs> it's all we've got, darling, and we cherish it. <laughs> but uh, I must say, I think there's... Um, uh, an interesting point uh, that arises in your memoir uh, follows from that question, and in particular your answer to it. It did strike me uh, in the book that... Oh, we're back. Sorry, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Uh, did you miss me? <laughs> oh, it was terrible. It was far cleaner mm -hmm. uh, in the, the masses. Um, the, the, it did strike me that you, you seem to write, I think, quite viciously about women often. Uh, and I think you seem to be far less generous. Okay, well, tell me where I was vicious about. Uh, you refer to um, the, the incident of, of visiting the prostitute with Martin Amos, where you describe her as a, I'm trying to remember the adjective you use, but it's the something bitch. Um, avaricious, avaricious bitch. Avaricious bitch. That's right, well, yeah. She was. <laughs> she was a, a greedy little minx, yeah. Mm, mm. Well, without you can see so it in her eyes. <laughs> without citing chapter and verse, and she I, did have. I, I, I add, she had one of the most evil faces I've ever seen on a human being. Well, uh, 
she was... Uh, you, you're somewhat was, affirming was, the premise of my question as we <laughs> proceed. No, she, was, she, was, she was bewitching, um, in other words. But that's... But there, I mean, I have a duty to verisimilitude. I mean, that was the case with that, with that ca terrible cat house on Lexington Avenue. But you write... The most sordid morning I've ever spent in my life morning I've ever spent in my life. Sure, sure. You write affectionately ab about your mother, uh, about very few yes. other women. And Mrs. Thatcher. It w and, and indeed affectionately there too. Um, but... I, I on her chalet, um, uh, well, as I've already... As not, not your as wives. Azar as Nafizi, um, author, a great friend of mine, author of the unbelievably brilliant, beautiful book, uh, reading... Lolita in Tehran, which if you haven't read, you should. It was a, a tremendous defender of the rights of the downtrodden and raped and uh, dispossessed women of, uh, of, of Iran. But no, I'm sorry to say this girl in the Happy Isles knocking shop was, was a real woof boy. <laughs> uh, even now, I can think of it. But it was the greatest, that outing with, with Martin to the, to the handjob parlor was the best example I've, I can think of of turning lead into gold because it was a fantastically sordid and nasty and depressing expedition he made me come on. Field work, he said, for his novel, Likely Story, <laughs> uh, where this, this girl tried to keep on b bidding me up all the time. Uh, every time I agreed to a price, she'd raise it. Um, as I say in my report of it, the price was the only thing in the room that showed any sign of enlarging itself. <laughs> But when I would later read that, the relevant chapter of, of Martin's novel, Money, I realized it was all fine. That, that, these girls didn't know it, these avaricious minxes, but they were in the service of literature that day. And they have an, they've written an imperishable page. All right, uh, well, 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 we'll go back to them, shall we? For, we'll just give it one more go. <laughs> we're going to try microphone number three. Can I just, I just... Ironically, we could hear that for the first time, <laughs> but... Uh, and I just I, wanted to know how that support started and whether or it, not... It was, the, the question's in relation to Iraq. How did your support for the war in Iraq begin? Hmm. And do you now consider the war that you've supported a success? Okay. Um, a theme of my book, which I had thought at one point of calling both sides now, is the operations of the dialectic. And the way I could, as it operates in society and internationally and in the economy and so on, and also in, in my own cortex. So the one reason why I supported intervention in Iraq was because of my long history of opposition to it. I've been going to Iraq since the mid 1970s, since just before the time, in fact, when Saddam Hussein managed to get all power in his own hands. And I'd seen the steady evolution of the country into a, a one-man show run by a psychopathic crime family, as I've already said, with aggressive designs on its neighbors, um, committing genocide within its own borders, using weapons of mass destruction both inside and outside its, its borders, and borrowing from the worst of both fascism and Stalinism in its ideology. And I, I realized that the the anti-war position, the position of containment of this regime, was based on a false premise, which was that this uh, psycho leader uh, understood self-preservation and understood deterrence and containment and sanctions and so forth. That's absolutely not true. Whenever he can, he makes the most insane possible decision. And this is very terrifying. It's not unlike the dealings we're currently having with both North Korea and Iran, you cannot be certain, if indeed you have every reason to doubt that unlike as with, say, the Soviet communists, that these people have any concept of rational self-interest. They may even indeed be suicidal. Uh, so there's no possibility of relaxation while they're around. You can't sleep and there's no possibility of coexistence. Ultimately, I believe our, civilization, our civilization's existence is incompatible with, with um, neurotic expansionists latently and blatantly aggressive uh, xenophobic and theocratic regimes. So, and I 
I give a whole chapter to showing exactly how my mind changed. It's not about what I think, it's about how I think, which I hope is more interesting. And I, if you buy it, I'll sign it. <laughs> um, and as for now, well, um, in 2003, Saddam Hussein organized a referendum in his own favor, in which for the first time in Iraq, and I think for the first time in recorded history, uh, a, a turnout of 100% was claimed, as well as a recorded vote for the only candidate claim. Never been done before, with people forced to jump up and down, ululating and cutting their wrists to write their ballot papers in blood and shouting for jihad and martyrdom and self-sacrifice. Unbelievably horrifying business presided over by the dictator and his two sons, the, the voluptuously sadistic and deranged Udai and Kusai, whose succession was the thing we'd be living through now if uh, we'd allowed the chance to occur. Now, uh, the president of Iraq is Jalal Talabani, who I met when he was the leader of a gassed and murdered and dispersed Kurdish people, the guerrilla, the guerrilla socialist leader in the mountains in 1991, the first ever elected president of Iraq. His party is the corresponding party of the Socialist International. His people, the Kurds, have an autonomous zone protected and self-governing in the north eastern provinces of the country. There's a written constitution, there's a parliament, there's a court of appeal, a free press, regular elections. I know a lot of people think that it would have been better if we'd left Saddam Hussein alone, but I can't be of that party. I'm terribly sorry. I think this is an improvement. For your answer. You make the case passionately for um, the invasion of Iraq. What Intervention. Intervention in Iraq, liberation. liberation, sure. Um, what, um, do you not think that um, it should follow that America should intervene in all situations where um, the values of uh, liberal democracies are being undermined? Or what's the tipping point for you? Well, first, the, the United States um, and its coalition allies are in Iraq still under a United Nations mandate to reconstruct the country. So it's not a, a unilateral intervention. And the, uh, in my opinion, there was no need for a second resolution for the intervention after the Security Council had voted nine to nothing to say that Saddam Hussein must either come into compliance or face grave consequences. And the certainty is he never came into compliance. Iraq is now in compliance with the resolutions on weapons of mass destruction and has been inspected and now can be said to be free of them. But it couldn't have been said to be that before unless you're willing to take on trust uh, Saddam's regime itself, which I wouldn't recommend. I don't think after its record it was entitled to the smallest scintilla of the presumption of innocence. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, what do you have to do if you're a state to sacrifice your sovereignty? How far do you have to go? Well, there are four possible conditions. One is you invade and occupy the territory of neighboring countries. The second is if you violate the Genocide Convention, which mandates, by the way, if it's broken, it mandates action by all its signatory powers. If you can't, either to prevent or if you can't prevent, to punish the genocide. Uh, the third is fooling around with the non-proliferation treaty and trying to acquire illegal or use illegal weapons of mass destruction. And the fourth is giving aid and comfort to international terrorist organizations that, as designated. The Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, multiply guilty on all four uh, fronts several times. And its sovereignty gone, it was under a, a UN-imposed sanctions regime. Most of its airspace was patrolled by foreign aircraft to protect its people from a renewal of genocide. It was a matter of how long it could stay half slave and half free. I think that question was resolved the right way. Now, I don't know of any other regime that qualifies to have lost its sovereignty in quite that way. Robert Mugabe did send some mad troops into the crazy war in the Congo, but you can't say he invaded or occupied a neighboring country. He doesn't have any weapons of mass destruction. He doesn't give a sanction and cover to international terrorist groups. And even though his policy of food denial to areas of the country that don't support him is certainly criminal, I don't know if it would quite raise to the level of the Genocide Convention. And would you make the same argument about North Korea? North Korea um, 
is openly in breach of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, not that it's ever signed it, but I mean, in the uh, principles of same, um, it's, it's starvation of its people to a point where they're six inches shorter than South Koreans. That's a lot of starving. Starving and stunting people down to that extent is it, it, a terrifying commitment to keeping your people hungry. And it's a good question as to whether you can commit genocide against your, genocide against your own people. I certainly think it's worth discussing. Undoubtedly supports international terrorists and gangster groups without any question, as it does narcotics smuggling, um, currency forgery, and all, all manner of other uh, outlaw things. I think that certainly there's an absolute case for removing the Kim Jong-il regime, but we are subject to its nuclear blackmail. We are as much hostages to it as its starving slaves are. But on principle, of course, of course, yes. They're looking for a war with us, and they will probably, I think, have one. I think we should pick the time and the place of it and not them. Totalitarian regimes are incompatible with our existence. That will be found out one, however much we wish it wasn't true, it is true. It will be discovered, uh, it will be forced upon us, that, that awareness, if we don't develop it for ourselves. I want I won't pursue that. I'll give the uh, uh, microphone number two the chance to ask a question. Um, fun, though, discussing Iraq uh, is. Um, you can't, do, can't turn it into a filthy limerick, can you, Christopher? <laughs> so, uh, number two. It's a question on American domestic politics. Would you explain why it seems to me that um, the less well-off Americans on both the Democratic side and the Republican side, a significant percentage of them uh, seem to resent some of the bills which Obama is trying to pass, which would apparently do them the most use. Uh, perhaps the health bill, perhaps the financial services bill. They seem to resent it in a way that you might not expect. Yeah, I did. Um, there is among a lot of Americans, including those who uh, don't have any property and don't have any security of employment or, or income, there is a powerful resistance to state influence. Uh, it comes, I think, partly from the frontier. It comes in part from a, a sort of Calvinism that's quite strong among old pioneers has been handed down. It comes also, of course, as a legacy of the Civil War. Um, but there are many people who would say, if you, if you let me keep my gun and you stay out of my church, I don't want any more help from you, thanks. I'd rather live as if the government wasn't there. That's the point of being an American. I don't want to hear from Washington. It's my right to live in this part of Kansas unmolested. Um, this is paradoxically very beautifully expressed by a Tea Party rally a placard that I'm sure some of you saw recently saying, uh, keep the government's cotton-picking hands off, off my Medicare. <laughs> uh, because they've forgotten where Medicare came from. They, they, they thought it was a right that they had that they had to defend from Washington. It's not one of yeah. Jefferson's, I don't think. No, that no, is, no. That, uh, I think Mr. Jefferson would have had a slightly finer line on a thing like that. But that, that, that is the mentality, and that's also, of course, the irony of it. I think I deep down think Americans don't really want health care. They say they don't want it if they have to pay for anyone else to have it. They think life should be risky. <laughs> they think you should be taking your chances. They look down on countries where the government tries to make sure that everyone's life works out. So what do you make of the, the Tea Party movement and are you concerned by the tenor of the kind of groundswell of American politics at the moment? Do you think it's dangerous? Well, my new line on this, which I've tried out on a few people already, is um, the Tea Party movement proves that all politics is yokel. <laughs> um, I, went to, I went to one of their big rallies on Capitol Hill the other day. I took my, took my daughter, and in front of me, there was standing, a, a, in front of us, there was standing a guy who said, um, we didn't bring our guns. And then on the other side, said, this time. And then once it, I'm, I'm defending the First Amendment today, but I'll be defending the Second Amendment tomorrow, and that's the gun amendment. And I thought, ooh, I'm really scared now. <laughs> it seemed pathetic to me, actually. There was, there was a, a note of desperation to it and, and pathos, I, I thought. 
These are people who, in part, they don't recognize the country they used to grow up in. Small town, church, um, monochrome. Uh, they feel it changing. They, they feel powerless to affect it. But they're absolutely powerless to change it back. It's not going to change back. There's something plaintive about it. And, of course, they are... I don't want to sound like a snob. Oh, what the hell? Um, it's a bit late. Uh, they're, well, they're, a, lot of them, a lot of them are saps, is what I have to say. I mean, anyone who thinks that Sarah Palin isn't just cashing out on this and is going to make a few million dollars on her book and then leave them flat is a fool. She's a, a, ob obviously, classically, hollow, heartless opportunist of the shallowest kind. And she's going to leave them in the lurch once she's cashed out. And she seems to be the one who is their passionaria or their Joan of Arc. Well, this is no good. That was about... Uh, were you yawning? Not at all. No, no, no. I was, I was segueing. I thought you were stifling something. <laughs> How am I supposed to feel? <laughs> no, we were talking... Are we boring you? No. <laughs> I thought we might move from uh, American domestic politics to uh, British politics. And I, uh, uh, I thought I'd ask by... Uh, um, I would begin by asking you to compare the current Tory Prime Minister to uh, a former Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher, and perhaps you can tell us your view of the two of them. I don't know anything about Mr Cameron, and I shouldn't pretend that I do. Um, I'm, anyone who wants an illuminating discussion about British politics this month shouldn't be asking me, sorry. All right. Um, whereof, I'd like to assure you of this, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, where I don't know what I'm talking about, I try and shut the hell up. I can tell you about having a physical encounter with Mrs. Thatcher. Well, that's where I thought we might lead yeah. to, just to kind of ra round things up. Uh, we that's... could finish on Iraq, but I thought... That's about, that's about... That would be dragging things back to my m memoirs, but that's what I'm here for. Well, so, um, uh, one of the women you do talk about, and talk about sexually, yes. is Mrs. Thatcher. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can you... Uh, can you convince us that it's anything other than a ooh? I went to see her speak just as she'd become the leader of the opposition. It must have been 78 or 77, I suppose. And everyone, you can look it up, everyone in the press in those days, the Tory press too, which was still pro Edward Heath, would, was saying this is a spasm on the part of the Tories. This is a shrill suburban housewife, unelectably right wing, ignorant, provincial and so on. It's amazing to go back and look at this. I thought, I don't think this is true at all. I've just seen her speak to the party conference. She's got some of the, the most perfect skin I've almost ever seen on a human being. <laughs> Unbelievably lovely eyes and a roll of the hip that would, you know. But would it? Yeah. <laughs> and so I wrote this in the New Statesman saying I thought she had a sexual hold on her party. Now, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of rough mail in my life. <laughs> the worst how could you possibly mail I've ever had was about that. But I thought, no, no, I'm sure I'm right. And so I went to a reception in the House of Lords where I knew she was going to be, thinking, I must, I'm going to follow up on this. And we were introduced by Peregrine Worsthorn. And... I thought she recognized the name, because I think if you're the leader of the Tory party and a young man, then rather a handsome young mammal, um, working for the leading socialist opposition paper, says she, he thinks you're sexy, it's possible you remember his name. Anyway, it seemed to me that she did. So we got into a fight about Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, where I was right on the point of fact and she was wrong, but where she stuck up for her position so well that in the end I thought, ah, it's not that big a point. I said, well, no doubt there's much in what you say, uh, ma'am, and I, I bowed as if to acknowledge that we could move on. And she said, no, bow low. <laughs> and I felt all volition leaving me. And I <laughs> bowed further and straightened up again and began to say, no, no, much low. <laughs> so I was bent right over and she'd been rolling up the order of the day, the parliamentary order paper behind her back into a tube, stepped round behind me, smacked me on the bum. 
and I regained the vertical with some difficulty. <laughs> and she walked away and over her shoulder said, naughty boy. <laughs> I thought I was going to come in my pants. Anyway, <laughs> as I trudged back home over, over Westminster Bridge, I thought, this woman has really got something. She's got real charisma. And, and well, you laugh. But every single male opponent of hers in the old Tory establishment was within a couple of years completely taken off the chessboard and put back in the box with without compunction and on their part without resistance. They, couldn't, they could do nothing to stop. She, was, she magnetized them, she hypnotized them, she had them under her spell. And I think I was very lucky to get an early glimpse of this. And it's in my book and if you buy it, I'll sign it. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you meet her uh, many times other than that? Occasionally a car would draw up with no uh, license plates outside my apartment. <laughs> And you assumed the position. <laughs> and uh, cur the curtain's drawn and <laughs> a chauffeur would... Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't do to bandy a lady's name too much. <laughs> we have time for one more question. I do apologise to those who've uh, been waiting at the uh, microphones, and I'll, but I will go to microphone three. No, if you have, but if you had to give up one, which passport would it be, the British or the American? If you had to give up one passport, which would it be? That's a waste of a question. <laughs> Pass, OK, well. <laughs> I'll, I'll take your lead on that one. Question... Anglo-American. Anglo-American? All of the above. We'll take question number two, then. Come on, comrades. Um, one cracker to finish us off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the other night on, um, I think it was ABC Radio, you commented on your distaste at seeing the... Uh, David Campbell's scandal on the front of the paper rather than the situation in North Korea. I was just wondering um, if you could comment on the evolution or the generation of journalism you've seen throughout your career. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing. All right. Well, uh, unfortunately, we, it, it... Have you got one? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, I would like you to give us one and your dirtiest limerick to conclude, if possible? They tend to be clerical, um, the really dirty ones. Uh, it was a young fellow of kings whose mind was upon higher things, but his real desire was a boy in the choir with an ass like a jelly on springs. <laughs> That's not very dirty, though, but it gives no. you an idea. It's a curtain raiser for the anti-clerical. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Bishop of Central Japan used to roger himself with a fan. And when taxed with these acts, he replied, it contracts and expands, rather more than a man. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, you can do it with almost no dirty words. That's the key thing, I think, is to keep it, keep it filthy but not smutty. Um, a vice both obscene and unsavory holds the Bishop of Barking in slavery with lascivious howls, he deflowers young owls, that he lures to an underground aviary. <laughs> um, well, and, OK, you want one dirty one, then. Because <laughs> these are suggestive, shall we say, but mm. not... not um, it's, it is said of the Bishop of Birmingham that he fucks little boys while confirming them. They kneel on the hassock, he lifts up his cassock, and pumps his Episcopal sperm in him. <laughs> That's quite dirty. And on that note... Uh, but very contemporary, I think. Indeed, very indeed. Contemporary. Well, as, the, as, the, um, as the new Elton John song for the Vatican now goes, don't let your son go down on me. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, there's absolutely no doubt uh, that Australia loves... Christopher Hitchens, it's wonderful to have you here. Love him back. Hitch 22 is the book. It will be signed in the foyer afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Christopher Hitchens.